we're going to go ahead and get started now at the top of the hour, and we'll just let other people jump on as they can. And for those of you who are joining us on recording, also welcome to you. Um, so tonight is really a celebration for me of uh, the past couple of months of activity. I was so glad to be in a class with Carrie and Annie over the past couple of months and was drawn to them because we seem to be operating in the same spaces, which is relational health. And the interesting thing is that even though we're operating in the same spaces, we each bring to it uh, a different message and we also bring to it a different entry point. So in my case, my entry point is on the topic of divorce. For Carrie, it's on the topic of breakups, which can include divorce, but, but often doesn't. And then also for Annie, it's on the topic of a coming out life coach and also people pleasing. And so as we're gathering tonight, we have just a, a wide variety of interests and exposures. And so we're very excited to be bringing those together and to sort of see what happens as we help give you real practical mindsets, strategies, and frankly, just some normalizing of the reality of relationship discomfort in our world. Um, I'm going to start with their introductions. And uh, Carrie, why don't you lead us off and just let us know a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Carrie Jarislow. I am a relationship coach and soulmate expert. And I help people go from heartbreak to soulmate by teaching them the secrets to finding and maintaining empowering, fulfilling relationships. Uh, one of my uh, reasons that I got into this was from my own experience of going uh, through breakup after breakup after breakup after breakup, <laughs> so many breakups, finally leading up to my divorce that I just knew I had to figure out why it was always happening to me. And I did. I figured it out with the help of some incredible coaches, um, energy healers. And through that process, I not only healed my relationship experiences, I also healed my relationship with my father, which is was what I call the initial wound, the number one relationship of my life. So I healed that healed the relationship with my first husband. We became very good friends. And then every relationship after that with men was just very, very different. And so it, you know, got me thinking, well, what was it that I did? And so through that, I wrote a book and have a process to help people through, you know, heartbreak to soulmate. So that's me. I love that, Carrie. I love that you have such an energy around really the redemption of, of difficult storylines. You know, I, I think a lot of people fall victim to them and it sounds like you've really, you know, used the manure to make a, a flower bed, if you will. <laughs> it was tough there for a while, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay, Annie Henderson, your turn. All right, so I am a coming out coach and a coach for people pleasers who struggle to say no, avoid conflict, and tend to over-apologize. And for me, I was a people pleaser from an early age, which led me down a path of saying yes to everyone but myself. Uh, I ended up getting married at 19. Um, I was asked and I said yes, because it wouldn't be, wouldn't be very nice if I didn't, um, stayed in my, in my hometown. Uh, finally, I came out after having my daughter in my, uh, mid twenties and I, it wasn't the magical rainbow that I thought it would be, uh, because I was still a people pleaser. I jumped into a, a toxic relationship and, uh, struggled with that and finally figured out that, you know, I have to work on myself first <laughs> before I was going to find what I was wanting out of a relationship. Um, so now I'm celebrating 10 years this year with, with my uh, partner. And um, so that's been my path of making sure that I wasn't that kind of role model for my daughter. And um, she is definitely not a people pleaser like I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yay. <laughs> Yay. And you also have a book, as I recall. I do. Uh, yeah, I was, a, I co-authored, um, she did it. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And that was, gosh, I think at the time, and it was last year. So coming out coach is a new, um, a newer niche for me and really speaking to my people and embracing that. And at the time when I wrote uh, my chapter in that book, I was, I, and I still have a group called End Mom Guilt, but I really worked with overwhelmed moms. And, you know, at the time I thought I was niching down and I realized that's all moms. <laughs> all moms are overwhelmed. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you, Annie. And thank you both for being here. And my name is Andrea Hoops, and I am a licensed social worker and a certified divorce coach and certified divorce re transition and recovery coach. And I help people all across the divorce continuum, whether they're in the do I or don't I phase, the messy middle, or the I'm five years out and why is my divorce still bothering me stages. And I help those people to really resolve their divorce debris and start to create beautiful two address families in the event that there's children and really just a beautiful life in the event that there isn't children involved. And so I am very passionate about doing divorce differently if it has to be done. And that comes again from my own story of divorce, which was when I found out I was going to be getting divorced, I sort of looked around and I saw a lot of people who didn't look like people I wanted to look like. <laughs> they, if they were divorced, they were bitter and, mm -hmm. and depressed or still full of like snarky comments about their former partner. And you could just tell there was tension that didn't sit well with the kids. And mm -hmm. I really didn't want that for myself. So for the last decade, I've been on a, a search and a march to, to figure out how to make a beautiful two address family and figure out how to champion my former partner and I can say that I have had success, a lot of success in that area. I enjoy a great two address family and, and my kids are situated in that. I don't for a minute think that they wouldn't rather have the two of us sharing the same address, but we have learned how to work together as a family um, the way that we're structured now. And I have a book coming out as well. It's called The Best Worst Time of Your Life, Four Practices to Get You Through the Pain of Divorce. And so together collectively tonight, we've got three coaches, three authors, all coming <laughs> at you um, with the aim of supporting you in the relationship discomfort that is part of being human. So we're going to get started. If you have any questions, you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A button. If you click on Q&A, you will be able to type in a question to us. It will come to us. No one else will see it and then we can answer it. If we find that your question isn't maybe perfectly suited for our webinar tonight, we will 100% make sure that we send you an answer if you can put your email in the request and we will make sure that we get you what you need. So first of all, starting out, we need to define the terms. What is relationship discomfort? Carrie, maybe you can start us out with that. Yeah, you know, there's a couple different kinds of relationship discomfort. There's one that where you feel like you're not safe. And I just wanna kind of put that out there. That's not really, I think, what we're going to be focusing on tonight, um, but just to acknowledge that there is that kind of discomfort. Um, the discomfort that I think we're gonna be speaking more towards is something that happens in interactions with your partner that makes you feel uncomfortable. And I think it's maybe because you don't know what it's triggering, you don't know what it's about, but they do something, say something that just makes you not feel good. Um, it's as simple as that. And uh, learning what it means, what it's triggering and how to use it, because I think that that's sometimes what causes breakups or divorce. You know what? This is not easy. This is not going well. And so this just must not be a useful relationship or this might not be a fulfilling relationship. Um, but there is a way to look at that discomfort and actually use it to grow as an individual. So that's how I would define it. I think that's a great definition. And thank you for putting that clarification in there that we're talking about sort of garden variety relationship discomfort and not the kind that requires you to take action to protect yourself, certainly. Um, Annie, as we're thinking about relationship discomfort, I guess I'm just wondering why do we keep getting in it? Why, why, are we, why do we find <laughs> ourselves in it so often? 
<laughs> That's a great question, right? And and I know personally for myself, it was me um, continuing to not heal my own wounds and not deal with my own triggers so that I would hop into a new relationship thinking, you know, jumping into something new, I could leave the old behind. And instead I, I took me with it. So mm -hmm. I still had those same struggles and those same issues that were not dealt with. Right. Yeah. And, and I think we find ourselves in it too, because we're, we're just human. We, mm -hmm. we, we don't have discomfort or as much discomfort sometimes when we're, when we're alone, we get pressed on by other people. Right. And, and when that happens, it's, there's an irritation and an agitation and usually very quickly a jump to assign blame for that discomfort. And it is usually not ourselves. <laughs> <It's> usually <laughs> the other person, right. Is doing something to, to cause our discomfort and therefore could do something else to relieve our discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie, I'm curious to know if you feel like relationship discomfort is avoidable. No. <laughs> Why would we want it to be? See, that's the thing. When you talk about like repeating experiences over and over and over again, that's the name of my book. Why do they always break up with me? And it doesn't matter who it is. It was like completely unrelated boyfriends but it was the same experience. And then only when I stepped back and said, what is the one constant? And that was me. <laughs> I was like, okay, I gotta like, I gotta look at myself and be willing to have the courage. And what I found really is that those triggers and those discomforts, if I leaned into it and, tr and understood or tried to understand what that discomfort was about, it propelled me and my evolvement, my growth as a person made me a better person because I was able to take that uncomfortable discomfort and, and use it as an opportunity. So I don't think it's avoidable, nor would I want to avoid it. Now, look, I don't want to live in discomfort all the time. <laughs> I, I like for things, you know, I, I'm, I was the person in my family who wanted everyone to get along. You know, so when my parents were going through the divorce, it was like, I'll just take on everyone's pain and just make everyone feel great because then I'll feel better maybe. Um, so I don't like to live in discomfort, but I also don't like to be scared of it because I know there's an opportunity in there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I feel like one of the lines I'm always talking to my clients about is pain is the invitation. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, relationship discomfort is the invitation. And I think what's important is for us to start seeing it as a friend, mm -hmm. to start seeing it as a teacher, and to start seeing it as something that doesn't push us into sort of an immediate fight or flight reaction, mm -hmm. but one that just is, it, it's just sort of neutral, like, hmm. I guess I'm here again, learning this thing, experiencing this thing. How can I go deeper? Annie, what are you thinking around that? <laughs> yes, definitely. So I think we're going to dive into triggers probably a little more later, but yes. um, yeah, in, in embracing that. And I think I just had that conversation with a client this week on, okay, if there's some resistance, right? Instead of avoiding like people lasers like to do, right. like getting curious, like, why, why am I feeling this way? What is it? Instead of just retreating and, and using some tactics that we learned growing up, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever maybe was modeled for us, um, just getting, getting a little more curious and, and um, figuring out what that means for us instead of retreating and, and going into our shell. Yeah. I, and I, I feel like that, that really sums up step one. To me, step one is your posture. What is your postures toward the relationship discomfort? If it is no, or if it is, it's their fault, that's not gonna get you anywhere. The lesson that we're trying to pull out right now is it's just something that's standing on tiptoe asking for your attention, mm -hmm. nothing else. You don't need to hurry up and try to resolve it. You don't need to hurry up and put blame on it. You just need to notice it. And then we can, <laughs> then, and then we can go deeper. So where do we go next? right? After we've like, okay, I'm here again. 
the people on the webinar said, don't um, just notice it, right? But then where do we go next with this discomfort? Carrie, do you have any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, um, I go right to gratitude. I know that sounds crazy, but I pull myself out of the situation. I'm not one of those people. I think everyone deals with it in a different way. I'm actually not one of those people that say, we're going to talk it out until we're through it because I'm a very introspective person. So I need to kind of pull myself out of the situation, go up and do the things that I'm going to do to help me go inward and understand what the gift is. I first start with gratitude. I just say a, just a blanket. Thank you. I don't know why this has come into my life. It doesn't feel good. That's okay. But thank you for coming up. Cause I know this is an opportunity and I even say it, even if I don't believe it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I don't know why. And I really feel like crap right now, but I'm thankful because this is an opportunity. And then I have my things that I do to let my monkey mind go and get some intuitive communication. I take a bath, I do some yoga, I go for a walk, whatever it is, you know, that's where coming up with a self-care practice is really important because we wanna know what are those things I can do to clear, clear the heat and get some communication. But I would say gratitude, awareness, then gratitude is just awareness my and then gratitude and then self-care, okay. it sounds like. Yep, yep. And do you feel like that, sorry, I, I just talked over you, go ahead. No, you're good. I, I just am wondering, do you feel like that sort of sets the table for what happens after that? I do, yeah. And sometimes the inspiration will come right away. I'll be like, oh, that's what that was triggering. Got it. Sometimes it takes weeks, months. Sometimes I really can't, I just, or I need a coach or someone to help me understand what's there because it's so hidden and I don't want to know what that trigger was. <laughs> That's why it's right. hidden. <laughs> right. Annie, what about you? Where do you tell people to start after the noticing? Where'd they go next? Uh, yeah. So I loved what Carrie was saying about gratitude, because that's such a way to try to, to help calm down that amygdala, right? That part of our brain to, to chill out. Um, with my clients, a lot of times with people pleasers, we'll go straight to um, bullying ourselves, right? We'll be mm -hmm. like, oh, mm -hmm. you did, like you did this again, or why? Um, and, and blaming themselves. So just uh I like to throw that out there as a caution to, you know, you know, be aware and then just being aware. That's, that's like a point. It's almost like people jumping into meditation and how it's like, Oh, it's so hard. It doesn't work. Like being aware that, Oh, my thoughts are, are going off right now. Like that's a point. So I feel like right. being aware and noticing when you're triggered or noticing um, is like a bonus point. And then, not beating yourself up or if you do mm -hmm. just just giving yourself that that compassion um and then like carrie said i i'm someone that uh when i with my work in in school counseling um when you know little kids are, are triggered same with adults like talking when someone's triggered will do no good right mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to calm down and as carrie said that that uh, self-care gives you time to, you know, be aware and then calm down to where you can take that next step. And I think what you guys are both talking about, which I love, is that when we get in relationship discomfort and we've noticed it, we often want to attack it. And that's really the reverse of what's going to be supportive to us um, in, a, in our situation, right? Is we are not letting the actual brain chemistry do what it needs to do. So when you start to try to solve the problem from fight or flight, you're going to get a fight, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than getting yourself notched down to this place. So, so I feel like we should, I feel like we should keep going on this. And so when I'm thinking about that, that is a very much an invitation to go inward. And I'm curious, Annie, if you want to start us out on uh, I, I think we all three have s sort of similar but distinct ways that we invite that inward process, um, not only for ourselves, but for the people that we help. And Annie, I'm wondering if you could walk people through your process of going inward whenever whenever we've sort of gotten past the noticing and calmed ourselves down, what happens next? Yeah, so, um, and 
and I'll take a slight step back. So yeah. for, for me, I'm a, I'm an EFT practitioner. Mm-hmm. And part of that is, you know, cleansing and going through and, and calming yourself down while saying, you know, the, the thoughts and the feelings that are coming up as well as some, some reinforcement and, and affirmations. And I feel like that's a way to just start rewiring those, um, pathways in your brain to where it's, it's, you know, I, the, a client that I worked with today, they were just like, oh, I just feel so relaxed, <laughs> even though we're talking about often triggering things. So finding something that is going to work for you and not, you know, not everything works for everyone. So I think having a toolbox of, I can try this, or I can try this. And some people it's meditation and some people it's EFT. Um, so I think, I think that helps. Yeah. Great. Carrie, you want to add on to that? I want to second the EFT, emotional freedom. You, I was going to say, could you clarify what it is? Too, so it's emotional freedom technique. And I, it is a really teachable, learnable um, system that uses trigger points and you tap on it while you're um, saying, you know, something that you're struggling with, like, um, you know, uh, even though I'm uh, feeling really pissed off right now, it's okay. And I love myself anyway. And then you tap on these, um, these uh, points and uh, meridians and it, it moves the energy. Like it's, it's just because some of these triggers are stuck energy. So yes, it's mental, but it's also energetic. And so when you're tapping it out, it just moves the energy. I always feel relaxed. And that's a great energy technique for people to learn. You can go or we can like send you information, email us because there's some that are great on YouTube. There's some that are eh, on YouTube. Um, <laughs> it's a great technique. It's an awesome technique. So I second that, Annie. Um, Yay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, I decided back in 2016, I was completely lost. I was a mother of a three-year-old and a seven-year-old and I owned businesses and I was just like, I don't even know who I am. And I decided that I was going to start a self-care practice. And I'd been doing yoga for 20 years, but very inconsistent. And so I decided that I was going to do it every day, five minutes, like just three sun salutations or something, just get on my mat every day. And I would document it in my book. And even if I didn't want to come there, even if I was sick, I'd still do that. That was my self-care practice. So coming up with something that feeds your soul, that's what I think the self-care practice is. Something that you can do every day that doesn't take a lot of time, something that um, sings to you, something that you can do when it's raining outside or cold, you can't get outside, but you can get in every day because that self-care practice is the way that I know I can get on my mat. And it just, it, now it does something cause I've been doing it for four years. Now it's something that just instantly takes me inward. You know, it's just an in, inward. I mean, I just ask the question and then I'm quiet for a moment, maybe only half a second, but I just ask the question and then I allow the answer to come in its own time. Mm-hmm. I feel like a little bit what we're talking about is the, the difference between top-down regulation and bottom-up regulation, right? The bottom-up regulation uh, is really your, your physical experience of calm and safety, but most of us live a lot of our lives, maybe 90% of our lives from the shoulders up, right? We're, we're constantly trying to ratchet. How do I get my thoughts to work out so that I can be more comfortable? And we don't realize that a lot of the wisdom in that comes from the bottom up, comes from yoga, comes from walking, comes from bathing and experiences those sensations. And so we want to make sure that in our going inward, that we have a conversation between the upper and, and the bottom mm-hmm. halves of ourselves. And, and one of the things that I do uh, with my clients as far as offering one of those top-down strategies is I have them answer five questions when they get in this spot after they've done a little bit of self-care to sort of warm up the system. And the first question is, what am I scared of or anxious about? Mm. 
because usually when we get in these relationship discomfort places, we're just, what, what am, but if you really ask yourself, what am I really scared of? You get scared. I'm afraid they're going to be like this forever. I'm scared. I'm never going to be happy again. I'm scared that I'm going to get, you know, sidetracked. I'm not going to be able to take the steps I want to take. I don't have any autonomy, whatever it is. What am I scared of and anxious about? The second is how can I self-soothe this situation? Self-soothe does not mean alcohol or shopping, right? Because self-soothing is what we do when we can find a way to relieve ourselves that also has positive consequences. Yeah. And, and dialing into that, I think is a little bit what you guys are talking about. What is the thing for me that brings the calm? The third question is, and it's the harder one, <laughs> is what do I need to confront in myself? Ooh, and great. most people don't want to look at that, right? Because what they want to confront is what's in the other person and what ha that person <laughs> is doing to make the situation difficult. And so what do I need to confront in myself can look like, uh, well, I, I wasn't very kind today, or I was really self-consumed, or I don't really care anymore. And so it, it's showing. So whatever it is you need to confront in yourself. The fourth question is, how do I contribute to my own unhappiness? Mm -hmm. And I love the answers to these questions because we think our happiness is outside of us when it is in fact something that we have a certain measure of control over. And so thinking about the ways that you're making it worse by catastrophizing, by overreacting, by resisting. And then finally, the last point that I offer up or question that I offer up is what is true today about me, no matter what? And that just really brings us back to home base because often relationship discomfort can cause us to call into question everything about ourselves. Like, well, I don't even know what's true about myself. And so when you can start to answer that question, you, you come back to, um, you know, really just a home base, which is what I feel like going inward is all about. Going inward isn't about figuring it out. It's a, really a lot more about allowing it to be. And answers flow from the place of non-resistance. Yeah. Do you guys agree with that? Definitely. Surrender, right? It's, it's the hardest <laughs> and it's thing. Hard, it's hard because we want to throw all kinds of meat. I mean, we just really want to wrestle with it. And so many times the answer is waiting for us on the other side of quiet. Mm -hmm. It's yes. so true. And that's why baths do it for me. I don't know why it went for me. I <laughs> yeah. in the bathtub and I just take a moment and have an aha moment. And then I start getting all of these, oh, that's what that was about. I thought I'd figure that out. Right. Uh, yeah. So so let's let's talk about triggers because relationship discomfort doesn't usually come out of nowhere. It comes out of something and it and it pushes a button. And Annie, maybe you can start us off with um, talking a little bit about triggers and how we identify, address, assess, and move on with them. Yeah. And I, and I feel like I keep jumping around a little bit because when you're talking about triggers, it makes me think of uh, the, the four R's and the first yeah. one being resistance, right? Um, and which in, in my head leads to just some, some lack of communication, right? So I might be triggered and initially I'm not going to say anything because it's so small. Like it's just a little small thing. And then those things start to compound and compound to where then it leads to resentment if, if they're mm. not addressed. So triggers, I, I definitely think are an opportunity. Old me, uh, triggers would have been, you know, more like a boundary and then avoid that and go to a safer space. And I, I feel like that's just part of maybe the way I was, I was raised. And now triggers are definitely an invitation. Kind of like y'all said earlier, an invitation to learn something about yourself, right? Because if we have a chance to grow in, an, in a new area, why not? Like it's such such a, a cool thing to think about. Like I, I turned 40 last year and <laughs> thank you. Welcome. It's, it's great so far. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, um, I, I just think it's fascinating that we just can continue to grow and, and learn. And my daughter's 14 now. So being able to learn right along with her, she's still learning. I'm still learning and, you know, putting myself back at her age, I, didn't really picture my mom, like the age I am now. And the fact that 
there's, they're still learning too. She's still learning and that's, and that's okay. But um, yeah, I might've danced all around that question, but no, <laughs> triggers, I, love I want you to summarize the, four, good. The, 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 <laughs> right. I want you to summarize the four R's again. You said resistance, resistance, resentment, resentment rejection. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's Skeeter and That's then great. repression and repression okay. being, um, like I'm done. <laughs> like it's too, like, it's too bad at this point. I've ignored it when it was at resistance and then resentment right? Is it just keeps compounding and getting bigger and bigger. And so and this we, would be the just... path of a trigger unaddressed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. So snag those triggers when they're small and, and, um, right. They, it might seem like nagging. Oh gosh. Especially to a people pleaser, right? Yeah. <laughs> because they're like, Oh, I can, I can, I can handle this. It's okay. Like that's so small. I'm not going to bring it up, mm -hmm. but no, that's just good. It's good way to build on the relationships. That's excellent. Thank you, Annie. That is really helpful to see the path because it often does feel sort of minor, right? We just sort of let stuff yes. come and go because we don't want to be the person who overreacts, but there is a time and a place to make sure that we're sort of doing an inventory to see which triggers are actually Definitely. starting to build up a wall in us. And, I love a, that. and a way to address it, right? <laughs> There's always a good way. <laughs> yes, right. Carrie, you want to add to that on triggers? You got any thoughts you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, well, I work in energetics, right? So I see, I see the energetics. I'm an intuitive. And uh, we attract certain things into our lives, certain people into our lives to heal certain aspects of our lives. So a lot of times when people trigger something within us, they're reflecting something back to us. So I always have my clients start with, what is your biggest complaint about the other person? And then let's look at how that's reflecting back to me. It might not be a direct reflection, like, oh, he just always wants to watch sports and he never wants to pay time, you know, spend time with me or pay attention to me. That's not so much like that's what I'm doing to him. But it may be that I want him to I, I want him to spend more time and spend more time with me, focusing on me, and I'm not doing that for myself. And so that's a trigger that says maybe I need to look at my own self care, look at what how I feel about myself. Maybe he's triggering um, judgments that I have about myself. And so to look at that reflection those relationships are really, I always look at people in my life as angels because they're here on my path of involvement to trigger me, to help me <laughs> heal it so that I can move forward into my life. And I don't have to continually get stuck in that pattern of creating it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I love that. When I'm talking about triggers with my clients, um, they usually fall into trigger, all categories. All triggers generally fall into one of five categories. The first is that they trigger your sense of status, which is sort of how you see yourself. And so somebody might be pushing on your own um, sense of your own reputation. Um, mm -hmm. The second is your sense of certainty and what you can count on. The third is your sense of autonomy or your ability to sort of move around in the world without people getting in your way. The fourth is relatedness or your sense of belonging in the group. And finally, your sense of fairness, which is obviously a big one in divorce. And what I notice is once I do an inventory with people to sort of identify where they net out on what, what are the top couple of triggers that they deal with most often. And it's interesting to see what they are, but then to also, just like what you were saying, Carrie, look for the ways to provide the very thing that you wanted to get from the other person for yourself. And so when you're in a situation that's uncertain, your temptation is to go to that person and try to get the certainty. Mm -hmm. and, and my invitation, and I think both of your invitations to our clients is, how do you go back to yourself? to get what you need and allow the other person to be who they're going to be anyway, because newsflash, they're going to be, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not changing. And so like, for example, in the sense of, of status, right? If someone might be 
in a divorce and they're feeling um, uh, attacked by their by their former partner on reg with regard to how well they parent. You can take that and say, I don't want you to be talking to me like that. I am a good parent and you need to notice it, which will get you one result. <laughs> or you can start to say, it's really important that even though this person cannot affirm my mothering capabilities, I can. Mm -hmm. And I know without a doubt, you know, back to sort of what's true about me today, no matter what, I know that I'm a great mother. I'm learning, I make mistakes, but I know I'm a great mother and I don't need other people to be telling me that to give me my sense of status. So that's sort of how it works in my in my trigger model. And I love what both of you are doing. I mean, the the, the four R's and the, and the sort of invitation carry that you offer to go, if you're going this way, how do you bring it back this way? And really that's, that's the summation of what we're trying to get at tonight, right? Is yeah. relationship discomfort is usually solved inside yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'll say one thing added to that is that I have found that in my own experience, and I see this with my clients, when I shift what is going on within me and I heal that outlet, you know, it's a plug in an outlet. It's like, am I, is someone able to plug in to my issue and trigger me? So in the time when I was healing from my divorce, I healed so much within me that I sat in a car with my father. I remember in Las Vegas and he said the things that I wanted him to always say to me since I was 12 years old. He said those things to me. And I'm oh. thinking, well, I didn't even ask him to, but there wasn't that outlet anymore within me because I had healed that within me. And so his experience and his um, interactions with me changed. And when he didn't, and he was just like, sometimes his, you know, he's super opinionated. It's like, ah, it didn't bother me anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, fascinating. So communication is something I feel like always comes up with a relationship discomfort. You need to talk it out. You need to talk it out. You need to talk it out. And I'm wondering uh, if you guys agree with that. And if you, if you don't, do you have an alternative to that? Annie, you want to, you look like you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I, <clears throat> let's see, I think Communication is key, but I think it needs to be the right kind of communication. Because okay. <laughs> if it's the wrong kind, it won't get you where you want to go at all. Um, I know I, I like to talk about the the book Crucial Conversations. Um, they have some great research in there where you know they were observing couples and they would observe them for. Um, I think, I think he was had hundreds of hours, but they could predict within 90% accuracy if they were going to break up or get a divorce wow. just by observing how they interact and how they speak to each other and all mm. of that. So I think that's very telling. Um, but then it also said after they were taught how to communicate a little better, then that number was cut in half. Like there, it, they did not <laughs> have to break up or, or go through that divorce if they had those skills. So I think that um, communication is key. And um, one thing I, I love to do with, with my family is we'll, we'll get around the, the dinner table. And instead of like, I guess I used to see in, in the old sitcoms where the parents would stand and the kids would be lined up on the couch and they would lecture to them. And instead we are like, okay, we just need to make it where communication goes all directions. So we would, you know, share like Scarlett, my daughter could share with us, like what something kind of a glow and a grow, what we're doing well. And also something that she thought we could work on, right? I would, I'm all about, give me the input. <laughs> I want to get better. And then we could do the same thing. And then it wasn't like we're talking down to her from this place of perfection. So mm -hmm. just kind of already opening those lines of communication and knowing that it's okay. And it's, it's good input for all of us. So yes, I, I am definitely all about <laughs> communication. I think it is key, but, but like we were saying earlier, I think being able to calm down and, and, and get to a place where you can have those conversations. I know some people communicate better through um, writing it out, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't get 
are interrupted or they don't get a little verklempt mm-hmm. in the middle of it and mm-hmm. can't finish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I tend to be a little more of that style because <laughs> I want to get it all out. Um, but yeah, I, that that's me. I, I love that. Also. And I absolutely love glow and grow. Those are great <laughs> words to put together when you're having that kind of a mm-hmm. conversation. Carrie, you want to add to that too? Um, yeah. Wow. That was, I'm learning so much from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Communication Definitely. is what we're talking yeah. about. Communication is, I think the most important thing in a relationship and it is a learned skill. I don't think, and especially the generations that are coming after us who are communicating via text and that, that we are a little bit losing the um, the practice of communication, because I think that's my husband and mine's biggest um, and best attribute of our marriage. And it is not easy. It is not easy. There are some times I'm terrified to talk to him about something that's going on with me. But every time I do, and now he also is a very open hearted listener. And I try to do the same thing. <laughs> and I succeed some, a lot of the time, but sometimes I don't. We all don't, you know. It's it, that, like I said, it's you learn how to do it by doing it. And so the keys to communication, I think, are one, open-hearted listening, to be able to allow someone to talk and speak, and for and to have them feel and know that they're heard. Okay. Two is the trigger aspect, to know that if my partner says something to me, as an open-hearted listener, I'm going to listen, and then if something triggers me, then I'm going to go off and figure out why it's triggered me. So we have this thing that we say, which is, you've just triggered me, I need to go off and understand why, and let's come back together. And that's just a really, that's how we handle it, and it's healthy for us. Um, because if we go down the road of just speaking from the trigger, mm. then it's not so good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get that. And as I think about communication, especially through the lens of, of divorced relationship communication, the thing that I'm always emphasizing relates to uh, championing your former partner, which I know a lot of people don't want to do and find impossible at the outset. But when we're working on it, the 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 spotlight very easily goes to what isn't. It's true when we're looking at ourselves, when we're looking at our partner, and it really is the sort of least knee-jerk reaction our brains give to us. It's so unhelpful to always be seeing what isn't. And so my encouragement to people as they're thinking about sort of taking that 1% step that they can take to level up in communication is to really be cautious. The percentage of critique versus affirmation that you're offering in the context of the relationship so that you can really sort of, I don't know, create a softness around um, when you're actually gonna bring up something that matters because half the time when you're bringing up the critique, it's one of those things you need to take back home to yourself anyway, right? Yeah. 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 (laughs) And I think like forgiveness and compassion with people, you know, because I'm not a perfect communicator, neither is my husband. And so, wow, I did not do well right then. I'm really sorry. That was not my best self, you know, and be able to own it and hopefully um, acknowledge that and show compassion with whoever the other person is. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, so as we're wrapping up tonight, um, I want to thank you all for being here, by the way, I can, I can see the the people that are here and thank you for your affirming comments here in the chat as well. Uh, I want to talk about healing. And I want to talk about healing because even just saying the word is appealing and, and something that we all desire when it comes to our relationships. And so I just, I'm just wondering as we're closing out, if you guys could each offer sort of what's your, what's your 1% thing for tonight that you can offer to people as a way to increase their comfort in their relationship, increase their comfort with themselves, something that you just want people to walk away with tonight who are in a relationship that they're struggling to manage? What's your, what's your final advice? Uh, for, <laughs> um, one, one 
sentence stem, as my, the old teacher in me calls it, um, yeah. that I love from Brene Brown is just a great communication piece. Um, and and the, the phrase was, the story that I'm telling myself is, right? Mm-hmm. Which really softens. <laughs> so it's not an accusatory, you said this and you did this and you made me feel this way. It's the story that I'm telling myself is. And then it leaves room for that other person to correct or agree. So I think um, for a little a little takeaway that's not even mine <laughs> for Brene Brown, I think that's a, uh, a great piece to just take with you and try it out in all different situations where you might feel a little uncomfortable, right? Uh, trouble being vulnerable, as Brene likes to say. Um, it's a great piece to soften t- having those c- tough conversations. I love that. Thank you, Annie. That is very beautiful and a fantastic thing to have written on your mirror so that you're looking at it every <laughs> <Yes>. day, <laughs> even as you're starting the day. Carrie, what about you? Um, I would say to go into the inquiry of how do I love myself? Really not in that you know ego love, but how do I learn to love myself and show myself compassion? Because as we l- learn to love ourselves, we then attract that loving relationship and that loving exchange and learning to communicate with ourselves. You know, as we learn to communicate with ourselves, we learn how to communicate with others as well. And um, to me, it always comes back to building that relationship with myself. So. Yeah, I love that too. And, I, and I'll add my final one in too, which is um, typically our reaction to uh, a situation with our partner, whether that's a, a married partner or a dating partner, even a divorced partner, could be changed almost immediately if we respond with the phrase to ourselves and even maybe ultimately to them, I'm really afraid that, Mm -hmm. and fill in the blank. Because when we're getting triggered, we're just scared. We're just worried. We're worried that you, you spent the money on that and now I'm just afraid we're never gonna go on vacation. And you know, I, you you didn't take out the trash, and I'm afraid you just think I'm responsible for everything in the house. And and I'm just using really basic sort of top level stuff. But even as you get in deeper, when you're like you're watching the football game instead of me, and I'm just afraid you've you've forgotten who I am anymore. And that sort of softens your own self toward the situation and gives you a softer, like Annie said, a softer place from which to to mm-hmm. continue the journey. So. Thank you for your words tonight, ladies, and your and your summations and your little monikers. I just, I love everything about it. Before we close out, I wanna make sure we give a chance for people to know how to find you, follow you, and keep hearing more of your wisdom. So Carrie, why don't you head off with how people can connect with you going forward? Yeah, thank you. And I wanna say thank you to you, Andrea. You're sure. amazing. Thanks for oh, putting thank me you. together. And I love how you moderate it and let it. So thank you for that. Um, The best way to find me is through my website, www.carriejarislow.com. You can get to all my social, uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and also my email address. I'd like to offer my book, uh, Why Do They Always Break Up With Me? Um, as a, a free ebook. I will email that to you. If you email me from my website, I'd love to send that to you. Wow. Um, and that's the best way to get in touch with me, carriejarislow.com. Fantastic. Wow, that's quite an offer. I think you're going to get some takers on that. Annie, what about you? Hey, uh, for me, it is the best place is just my, my website, Annie M henderson.com and then i think that's where i am everywhere facebook and tiktok yes <laughs> you guys TikTok. oh my god come yeah come yeah. come have fun on tiktok with us it's so fun um but yeah there's i think links to my my podcaster in there and the book and and all of this stuff so come and join us and i think i'm about to have a just a people pleasers quiz on there. So if you want to identify if you have some of those common traits, come uh, over and, and check it out. 
Fantastic. And you can find me at andreahipsdivorcecoach.com. There's two P's and hips. And if you hit my website, you'll find me also, also some links to Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I offer a free communication guide for how to talk with your former partner, even when they're difficult. So feel free to grab that. And uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned at the beginning, I just had a book come out called The Best Worst Time of Your Life. Four practices to get you through the pain of divorce. Yay. It just became a bestseller. Woo! So please uh, get of in course. line. It's gonna be it's gonna be coming out uh, April 30th, but it's available on pre-order now. So thank you all for coming tonight. And again, thanks to all the folks that showed up with us. We hope that you were able to grab even one thing that helps you level it up. You don't need to wrap your arms around the whole story right now, but if you can take one step in the direction of health and healing, we will know that we have given you some good things for tonight. So thanks for being here all and we will be in touch again if we do it again yeah. best to everybody Thanks, you guys all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.